Hello, and thank you for joining Society for the Performing Arts for an insightful conversation curated by Deborah Deep Mouton. My name is Claire Williamson, and I'm Director of Education and Community Engagement at Society for the Performing Arts. To just briefly describe myself, I'm a white woman with long brown hair, glasses, and I'm wearing a, a blue and white striped shirt. There are some uh, framed pictures on the white wall behind me. We are thrilled to be commissioning um, a new work by Deep called The World's Intermission as part of our inaugural Houston Artist Commissioning Project. The mission of SPA's Houston Artist Commissioning Project is to provide economic and creative support to Houston's artist community with six local artists award fun awarded funds to create original work that is premiering live on the Jones Hall stage this fall. To learn more about the Houston Artist Commissioning Project and to purchase tickets to the premiere weekend uh, coming up on November 12th and 13th, please visit our website. We are also grateful to the African American Library at the Gregory School, part of Houston Public Library, for their support of this program and their long partnership with SPA. I'm happy to share the virtual stage with Erica Thompson, community liaison at the Gregory School. Good evening, everyone, and greetings from the African American Library at the Gregory School. As Claire said, my name is Erica Thompson, and I'm the community liaison here. On behalf of the Gregory School and the Houston Public Library System, we are so thrilled to have you all join us here this evening. It is always a treat for us to link up with our community partners to explore the art, culture, and history of our amazing city in new, meaningful ways. I want to personally thank Claire for all of her efforts in making tonight's program possible, as well as the entire team at SPA for being such great partners. For those joining us who may not already be familiar, the African American Library at the Gregory School rounds out a trio of special collections research centers under the umbrella of the Houston Public Library System. We are located just outside downtown in Freedmanstown, Fourth Ward, and housed in the building that once was Gregory Elementary School, the first school for free Black children in the city of Houston after emancipation. Our focus here at Gregory is the preservation and celebration of Houston's African-American history and culture. We do this through archives, through exhibits, programming, and oral histories. Events like tonight's highlight the necessity of guarding and protecting the truth of our lived experiences, particularly in the most difficult circumstances. Colloquialisms of tomorrow not being promised have taken on greater significance and the staggering loss of life, be it from pandemic or police brutality, have made plain the urgency of documentation and preservation. When the pandemic first hit, libraries really had to reimagine what servicing our customers could and should be. Here at the Gregory School, our team became laser focused on how we could reach our community effectively while still prioritizing safety. And what this period has taught us is that necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, the shift happened really quickly with really no precedent, but with an arsenal of virtual donor meetings, uh, staff assisted research and online programming, we have managed to provide the same quality service outreach and information to ensure the work of preserving and promoting our rich history continues. For more information about the work we do here at Gregory School, please go to our website, www.thegregoryschool.org. Thank you again for joining us and thank you again, Claire, for having the Gregory School as a part of this immensely important program and discussion. Thank you, Erica. Glad you could be with us. Before we delve into the conversation, I would like to take a moment to humbly acknowledge the many indigenous communities that have long used and continue to use this land as a living and gathering space. SPA's offices in Jones Hall are located on ancestral land traversed by the Karenkawa, Atakapa Isha, Sana, Kualwitekan, and Alabama Kushada. We know that a land acknowledgement is not enough, but we look to this as a starting place of recognition and respect for the lived experiences of the people of this land and the forces that have led to this moment. 
It is now my pleasure to introduce Deborah Deep Mouton, awardee of the Houston Artist Commissioning Project. Deep is an internationally known writer, librettist, educator, activist, performer, and poet laureate emeritus of Houston, Texas. Formerly ranked the number two best female perform performance poet in the world, her recent poetry collection, Newsworthy, garnered her a Pushcart nomination and was named as a finalist for the 2019 Writers League of Texas Book Award and an honorable mention for the Summerlee Book Prize. In addition, a storybook opera entitled Lula the Mighty Rio will debut with Houston Grand Opera soon, and her memoir, Black Chameleon, is forthcoming by Henry Holt & Co. Deep is currently a resident artist at Rice University and the American Lyric Theater. Take it away, Deborah. Well, hello, everyone. I'm so happy that you all were tuning in for this conversation. Um, my piece, The World Intermission, really centers around the ideas of living as Black artists and Black family members in the midst of a pandemic. And we all know the trials that the last year has brought up. But I think that a lot of the struggles of the last year really have been different for Black communities all around the world. And I wanted to center on what that felt like in my body, in my bones here in Houston. But I know that that's not an experience that's just of my own. That's an experience felt by all artists and all people of color across this nation. And so I wanted to take this time to be able to talk openly with other artists and community members about what it means to take the kind of awareness that we've seen rise in the last year and move forward to make this world a little bit better. So the hopes and goals of the conversation today is to kind of recap the feelings, the emotions, the moments that we felt the last year and to figure out what do we do next? I have two amazing panelists joining me today to help me do that. The first is Shabrell Williams. Uh, Shabrell Williams is a soprano, who is a dynamic soprano at that. Um, and she has this amazing presence on stage and she is also an accomplished educator. Some highlights of her performing career include the soprano solo in Verde's Requiem with City Music Cleveland, um, Sadie Donastrog's Griffith, Cousin Blanche, and The Champion by Terrence Blanchard. The title role of Puccini's Soir Angel Angelica and Elle in La Voix Humaine by Paul Lynch. I never get these names right, y'all, forgive me. Currently, Chevelle is set to make her role in Opera in the Heights debut in their production Il Travatore by Verdi. Um, in 2022, Chevrell looks forward to a world premiere of her role of Esther in Ricky Ian Gordon and Lynn Nottage's new opera, Intimate Apparel. Our second wonderful panelist that's going to be joining us today is artist Sean Artis. Sean is a performing visual artist that can be seen creating live works of art at various venues. His prolific style has quickly established him as one of the top emerging visual artists in the Houston art scene. As a contributing artist, Sean has worked with the Starbucks Ethiopia Reads program, Art for Eli with the Ronald McDonald House, the Urban Souls Dance Company, the Art of Reading with Yellowstone Academy, the, w, the YWCA Via Colori, and the Center of the Hearing and Speech, IKEA, the Houston Rockets, as well as the Houston Texans. Artist has, um, I'm sorry, artiste's work has been displayed at the Houston Museum of Fine Arts, the Houston Museum of African American Culture, uh, the Lawndale Art Center, the Glassell School of Art, the Midtown Arts and Theater Center, Texas Southern University Museum of Art, the Cullen Performance Hall, the Art Institute of Houston, the East End Gallery, the Montrose Cultural Center, the Breakfast Club, and the Midtown Art Museum. Sean has been recognized as one of the top artists in the Bombay Sapphire Artisan Series with partnership with Russell and Danny Simmons, Rush Philanthropic Arts Foundation, He's also been selected as the featured artist in Houston's Via Colori Street Painting Festival for several years, which is a huge annual fundraising event associated with the Center for Hearing and Speech, a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping children with hearing loss learn to listen, speak, and read. His early influences include Ernie Barnes and John Biggers, who have both simulated him to expand his subject matter and art form. He's gone on to create artwork for celebrities such as Cedric the Entertainer, Erica Badu, and Houston's own Deborah Duncan. However, his biggest influence in artistic muse has been his daughter, Ari, who was, whose birth inspired him to create artwork that is diverse, inspirational, and spiritually impactful. Let's welcome to the stage Sherelle and Sean. Hello. Hey, everybody. Hello, <laughs> folks. 
Thank you all for sharing this time and just talking to me today. Um, I think it's so important to have artists that are working and moving around this world, talking about the world that they move around. And I'm just grateful to you both for being willing to do this. I hope that this is a fairly casual conversation. I think that we're all fairly <laughs> casual with each other. And I really just want the audience to be able to have some insight into our conversations that we have maybe offline. So I'm gonna kick this off really easy, first of all, to you. And just ask you all, as Black artists, how has the last year affected your work? I guess I'll start. Kick, kick yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll kick us off. Uh, uh, I would say this year in particular, like I'm, I'm having a lot more performing work than I have had before. And I think it's just, you know, there's this whole renaissance happening, I think, in the opera world where people are recognizing Black artists in all facets of the art form, you know, not just the performers, but the creatives behind the scenes and, you know, the librettists, the visual artists, all of that. And I just feel like I'm, I'm getting more, people are more curious about what I can do and what I can offer. Um, but, you know, in the last year, uh, a lot of my work was virtual and a lot of it was more teaching focused because that, that was the work that was available. I had a couple of performances, but most of those performances I've made on my own. Like I was like, all right, I want to sing some stuff with my coach. Like, let's let's record that. Let's let's make some music happen. Um, <laughs> let's like I, I want to make some music somehow live and in person, even though, you know, maybe have a limited audience and or just record it and then have it available for other people. But I don't know, I feel like I had now, like I feel like now because because I spent the time to like really just sort of hunker down and like really reflect on what I want to do and what I want to bring as an artist to the world, I can now like start actually showing that with the work that is actually coming in, you know, like without me actually looking for it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Sean, yeah. what about you? Oh, oh, well, I think that what we're going through now uh, on a personal level in regards to my art has made me a more imperative artist. So, the way I feel about time is different mm. because it just feels like the, the time that I exist in is so not promised and the ability to interact or receive an interaction from someone from the work I create is, is so much more vital and precious, especially uh, being in this new this new reality we live in, we don't really have the same human engagements that we used to have. So, me personally, I feel like I feel that others kind of yearn and hunger more for things that are created and that that feeling of a, a human connection more so than before, because we're so isolated from each other. So it's been quite it's been quite challenging for me actually so I, I went through emotional periods of confusion of sadness of isolation i had to kind of get through that first because i had to go through a period in which i wasn't really creating anything i, I just didn't have it in me to create because the world we were we're in is it's so different and a lot of creatives, they tend to be introvert, introverted until they get into their craft where they understand that what they're sharing is actually impacting others. So it's, it's, been, it's been quite a challenge. So I love that you both talk about almost this urgency centered around your work. Do you feel like that has more to do with the pandemic and the response to people kind of being shut in their homes? Or do you feel like that that's more... Um, kind of this new thing that we felt around Black artistry and the desire to have this curiosity that Sherelle mentioned around our art as Black artists. Sean, I'm going to start with you this time. Hmm. That's a great question. I would say for me personally, it had to do more with the pandemic because I, I actually experienced a two things so my name is sean artist a-r-t-i-s i was adopted at birth 
I had no idea where I came from. I had no images of either parent. I was raised by two older social activists. And it was in 2019 that I got on Ancestry.com and I finally found my mother. So I, she had passed on, but I finally found my biological family on my mother's side. And, and I was able to finally see an image of my mom on December 10th of 2019. So at that point, I was talking to my new family members. I got like a brother and a sister and I could not visit uh. any of my family members. So the joy of finding my blueprint and finding my origins got put on hold due to the pandemic. So this burst of just excitement and newness, I had freeze that until I was able, and I still haven't been able to visit them due to you know this new reality we're in. So to me, it was just like an emotional roller coaster, and just you know, as artists, the most important thing is almost a responsibility is the the courage to share. You know, so we need to share our gifts and our talents, but we also depend on society to kind of give us feedback so that we'll feel that what we're doing is actually working. So me personally, the pandemic and just everything about it affected me on an emotional level with my art. So Chabelle, for you, do you feel like this is more about the pandemic or is this more about the response to Kind of everything that happened last summer. I think it's both, honestly. I last summer definitely set into motion something that I think the world needed. Um, so we can actually start unpacking everything that is actually wrong and all of the things that we are doing systemically to hurt basically our society. Like we're yeah, so like that set into motion so many things. And then with the pandemic on top of it, I with everyone being isolated, it it sort of heightened the 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 sense that okay like actually we do need each other when we do need to be in the same space and actually make sure that all of these spaces are safe and that we all feel included and welcome and represented um so i i think in a way it's both and i you know for, for me personally like i i don't mind being isolated like i mm -hmm. am an introvert i love being alone i love my solitude so when the pandemic actually hit i was not i was one of those people that was like oh yes quarantine everybody stay inside while i go out with my dog and just frolic in the sun and the trees and like none of you are here with me yes, yes. stay home ah oh, so exciting and like the work like everything like the, the everything just seemed like it seemed like the world was actually starting to heal. Um, like the world, like the environment, like I was seeing more butterflies. I was seeing like, seeing just things growing in areas that I never saw things grow before. And so, but like, you know, now that things are opening back up, that hunger, like for everybody who didn't like isolation and everybody who, you know, actually want, like gets energy from being around other people, they're craving that. And I get it because I, I also like one of the reasons why I didn't do a lot of virtual performances when I was during the pandemic is because like I just I knew immediately that that's not how I wanted to I I, I wanted to present my my artistry in opera like I love the live factor of operatic singing you can literally feel it on your skin when you're in the presence and like you just like as beautiful as it sounds and as it can be like made like with cinematography in the film like I was excited to see that and how like the film world and opera would merge together to make something even more beautiful and cool. There is still so much merit for live performances. And there is also a lot of merit in uplifting and highlighting the black voice that has been so stunted over the years. So yeah, I think it's both <laughs> long story yeah. short. Sean, so yeah. I'm going to ask a kind of a two part question for you, Sean, then to kind of, cause I would love to hear your insight on a little bit of what Shabra brought up, which I, is. I, yeah. One uh -huh. is, is, are you that introvert that was really excited to be in quarantine? That's like my personal, I was, I'm like, <laughs> how did you take it? Were you the extrovert hey. or the introvert? Yeah, um, and then also, said, yeah, you know, yeah. what was your response to 
kind of the world shifting and the focus shifting to wanting to highlight a little bit more of black art last summer and kind of what has continued to go from that. Yeah, uh, like that point was like perfect because I think as creatives, even if you're not really just socialistically an introverted person, we have to spend so much time by ourselves working on what we work on that you 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 live like an introverted life when you're immersed in what you do so the beautiful part about uh what you were saying was that me it just it came to me that me being always sitting in this a, a, a chair in front of an easel or whatever for hours it it made me kind of yearn a little more for human interaction because everybody was stuck in the house so i was like <laughs> okay now i kind of want to be in front of people and i want to kind of it, it almost felt like uh humanity now appreciates the arts more and creativity in uh all of us who can uh evoke emotion into into this life experience so i thought that you know like like incredible how that kind of happened because um the funny thing is i think in my art i do a lot of social political kind of art because i feel like my art has to it has to chronicle the times and it has to say things to make people think but i often am the guy that's kind of raging against the machine called uh social media and mainstream media because i feel like we're in this thing now where we're not really looking at people for the beauty of the uniqueness of people we're looking at each other logistically like we're looking at your stats and and your new numerical value, which I don't like, you know. Yeah. And, and as artists, there's nothing better than creating something or performing or sharing what you do and you feel people actually absorbing and being healed by what you do. And so that's why it's so important as an artist a lot of us are kind of modest because we're constantly being vulnerable and sharing the lows and the highs so that the world knows, hey, you're not alone. Because we're trying to capture that either through literature, art, music, all of these things. We're trying to show you that you're not alone. And so it's kind of beautiful that this whole thing we're in, everybody's isolated, alone, we're seeing the news, they're constantly pounding you with negative, negative, negative. So it's like now when we go out, people want to feel better and happy and human. So I think it's going to be a, a great thing, you know, on the other side of this storm we're in. Yeah, I think those are all really great points. Um, I, I find myself now, though, when going out, feeling absolutely exhausted by being around people because I think I'm a little bit more like Shabrell. And I think what I learned was just that I had really conditioned myself almost to being what I call an occupational extrovert, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like for the job that we need to do as artists of being familiar and being vulnerable in the ways that you talk about, Sean, like we, we had to be open. And when we didn't, I was like, cool. <laughs> I'm not. But, yeah. Um, so like how how do you then think that we as artists kind of hold that place of balance? I think that you're kind of talking of Sean of like how do we hold both our vulnerability and also hold space for our private time, like Sherelle talks about, you know, and maybe even in different ways than we've ever done before, how do we kind of prioritize those moments? And that's kind of open to either of you who would like to speak. You know, I I always prioritize my alone time. Like I, I always do it, but sometimes I do it. I don't, I don't do it because I feel guilty for wanting to be alone and for wanting to isolate myself and for want for needing a recharge. And 
you know, for before I, I didn't know when I needed to recharge. So, you know, there were times where I was like, I would get really irritable or like maybe like, you know, be in a space, but like not actually be present because like, I didn't actually want to be there, but I had to be there and I had to be on and I hate being on. I do not like having to put on a face just to be in a space. And I, <laughs> And like, I know, I know we have to do that. Sometimes we have to play the game. Like, you know, we have to do things that we don't like. We're adults, right? Uh, Got to take on responsibilities and things that we just don't want to do sometimes. But I feel like this, this particular situation, the, the lives that we've been living in this past like year and a half, year and some change has allowed me to like really see and like, like, span out time when when I can like actually do self-care because like I realized until last year I didn't know what self-care was for me <laughs> I like I thought I was doing self-care but I was just I, I wasn't I just I just simply wasn't like I was still doing everything that I was doing um and like maybe just like taking the time for myself that I thought was self-care but I wasn't actually taking the time to like actually get the rest that I need, the mental rest, the social rest that I need. <laughs> the or maybe maybe even the rest from like my work. Like they were, you know, I took a break from like not practicing. I never had the thought that I was like, oh, I'm never going to sing again. The opera world is never going to be the same. Like I'm an extremely probably to my detriment, an extremely op optimistic person. So even when like the show that I was in was canceled, I was like, oh, it's going to come back. Who knows when it's going to come back? I know it's going to come back and we're going to be fine. And we're actually going to be even be better for it because we'll have time to like marinate and sit on it and like have new ideas. But at the same time, I had to like, okay, well, let me actually take a step back because I think that hope was leading me was like, okay, well, like I want to do it now. I want to do it now, but I can't do it now. And so it made me more patient. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think I answered the question. <laughs> yeah, you did whatever was, you said was amazing. So yeah, <laughs> that was great. Yeah. Man. Sean, for you, balance, what, what does that look like for you? And, and how do we go about, as even as a society, right? Like figuring that balance out. Man, that's a great question. I mean, just going through this interview, I'm feeling like, I'm. oh, man, I needed this, you know? <laughs> um, I don't know. I would say balance from a balance standpoint. How can I how can I say this? I I honestly, uh, like Shabrell said, I honestly feel like this pandemic has caused me to have more time to really do self assessments where I'm feeling myself more. Mm -hmm. Because like as creatives, there's always that part of you, especially when you start seeing your craft pay off where you're like oh wow you know me like oh wow they're buying it and oh okay you start <laughs> you get caught up in the next level of the, the competitiveness the i want to make each thing that i create better than the last thing mm -hmm. and oftentimes we we don't hear or, well me as a visual artist because my work you know it's i create it and then it's it's on a wall in a gallery or a museum. I don't necessarily hear the stories of people saying, "Oh wow, man, that, I needed to see that. I needed to know that someone cared about that part of life. I didn't think no one cared." And so we we get caught in this this loop of constantly trying to get better and better and better. And sometimes if you don't watch it it could be detrimental to your your mental health so honestly i think that the one good thing that i see coming out of the pandemic is there's seeming to be a lot more attention and focus on mental health and i think that that focus on mental health will start bringing up conversations about a lot of the things that exist in today's society that we tend to overlook that is kind of like a global problem, you know, mm. which I, I love social media. I love technology, but I think everything needs to have some type of system of checks and balances before it gets out of control. And mm. so hopefully what we're going through from a balance standpoint, it, it, I hope the world will improve. I hope people that 
are the actual people that care, that do the work behind the scenes, that don't already don't always get credit, get more support and get more recognition for the importance of, of that, which is balance, which is both personal and you know global. So all we can do is just stay positive and I think um you know uh as a side note it 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 kind of the pandemic in this new life we're in it's kind of pulling me more into sharing more digitally Mm -hmm. because i'm kind of you know i'm kind of like you know when i'm in real life like i'm on 10 because i could literally feel people but for the most part i'm kind of like a private person and i'm just in my lab coming up with ideas and trying to you know continuously build my body of work so it's a balance as well as in real life versus digital life and hopefully when we come out of this you know we'll have things in place that pays close attention to the mental health of people especially the young generation Mm. because Fortunately, when I was, you know, a young teenager in my early 20s, we didn't have this. You know, so we had to learn things in terms of uh, social skills. Like, I had to call the young lady's house that I was interested in, and her mom <laughs> might answer, her dad yeah. might answer. I had to know how to say, hello, may I speak to so and so? But these <laughs> right. days, it's to. You know, it's out of there. Everything is like point and click, you know. So I think balance through this whole thing, I'm kind of working on it internally. And it is my uh, hope and prayer that everyone kind of does a self assessment so that as a whole, we could kind of put things in place to help us on a global level. Yes. Yeah, um, I, there's something that you said about this kind of idea of like generations, how we've adjusted to certain things. And that brought me to thinking about, you know, we would like to center it on George Floyd, but we know that the abuse of power by authority has been something that has resonated through the Black community specifically for much longer than George Floyd's name has, right? Unfortunately. Right. And I think last year I found myself struggling with that generational thing of having to tell my daughter you know, what all of that meant. And my daughter, I remember her coming to me and saying, mommy, who's Brianna Taylor? And I was like, oh. like, I, I want to tell you that she was, you know, a, a worker and a daughter. And I don't want to tell you, I don't want who she is to be defined by what happened to her. Right. Exactly. And I know Sean, you have a child as well. And Sherelle, you are a child, right? Like <laughs> you are, you're around your mother quite often. And, and yeah. for us to think about living at these crosshatches, how do we go about, you know, watching that there's kind of these two struggles in America of, yeah, there's this pandemic, this big, huge thing everyone's reacting to, but there's also this huge thing that everyone's reacting to that is maybe a little bit more personal to us at times, right? As being Black people in a country who have seen this happen for years and years and years. So I I guess for me, I want to know, like, how has your Blackness affected the world that you see within the pandemic? Kind of the world within a world, right? Um, Shabrell, do you mind kicking us off? Yeah, I don't mind at all. So I, ugh, uh, I feel so like I'm definitely one of those people that is like free love. All, I I am an all lives matter person. However, mm-hmm. however, all lives cannot matter until Black lives matter, and that has always been the thing. We we do not matter, and I don't know if we still yet matter. Uh, you know, yes, we have Biden and Kamala Harris in the in the office now, but what are they actually doing to change the system that led to so many deaths last year. Um, So I feel like my, I'm definitely more aware of my blackness than I have ever been over these past two years. And not to say that I like, I was never like in the, in in the opera world because there's a whole thing going on there (laughs) as well with like, (laughs) like there's, there's all of that. And I feel like, so like, my my experience in this operatic world, I feel like I was one of those special blacks. Mm-hmm. So like one who was always tokenized. So I never really saw the racism because like I was always good, good enough. And like I got opportunities. Now, this was in school. However, like my professional life was a completely different story. All of the opportunities that I got there was because I was black. 
like all of the roles that I got professionally and like the gigs, I was like, okay, yeah, like we're gonna hire you for this. It was because it was a role for a black person. And I loved everything that I did. You know, the, the stuff that I did with Terrence Blanchard, like those are world premieres, those are roles I created. I'm so grateful and thankful for all of those things. However, why was I never able to, you know, really sing Mozart? Why did no one ever really hire me into a young artist program? Why did I never really win any competitions? I don't know. I, I never experienced any blatant racism. However, the sub, I, I could see the subtlety and I could feel it. And for the longest time, I think it's because like I never had as much opportunity as I had. I was like, ah, you know, I'm just sort of here floating around, singing when I can and trying to make connections when I can. Um, but now, like when the pandemic hit, I noticed that people actually wanted to hear my opinion and they, not not just because I was black, but because I actually had something to offer. I think the, the shift that I'm seeing is that they're not seeing that like, oh, we need a black voice because we're missing it. It's like, we need this voice because it's actually important and actually has a lot more to offer. And I'm, I think that that's how I'm seeing my blackness being used now. I'm deciding to see it more in a positive way as opposed to like being tokenized. Cause like that's still happening. <laughs> that's still happening all over um, because you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion is something that is popular right, right. now. Correct. It's popular. And now I'm just trying to like with my more discerning eyes, I'm now seeing like which organizations are using this time to be performative. And then I'm also seeing which organizations are using this time to actually pro promote and provoke real change in the industry. Yep. So I think that, I think I, I feel like I go off on these tangents. No, you, <laughs> that's beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. no worries. I think you're right on the task. Sean, yeah. what about you? How, how did your blackness affect the way you see the world within this Ooh, pandemic? Man, so <laughs> me, I kind of feel, well, to me, this whole thing has made me aware that it, all of this, all of this could shut down at any moment. Someone could pull the plug. It, it just kind of solidified those thoughts that some of us put in the back of our mind that, hey, this is something never really seemed right with this, you know? Kind of like that Wizard of Oz feel. So to me, I think, and I hope, I mean, on a personal level, I kind of don't care anymore. You know, <laughs> I, I'm i going to be bold, you know, you know, yeah. so I feel like life is temporary. We're seeing that this whole thing that we call America can be shut off at any moment. So it's your responsibility to be bold. And, and do the things that you know you sh need to do or that you want to do and stop worrying about what anyone else says. Because if we're truly vessels, then something is being streamed through you. Mm -hmm. So if, if these major mainstream networks can stream whatever they want to stream constantly to change the whole makeup of your mind to the point that you feel as if you don't even have a right to critically think or take your time and make a wise, conscientious decision about your health. That almost says that I don't even feel like you're human. So mm -hmm. to me, as far as a black man, I'm just like, hey, I'm gonna give it to you all the way now. Why not? Because if I don't, right the people that come behind me will fall prey to this same script that someone else is giving them, you know? Exactly. So that's kind of where I'm at with it. And I feel like as, as, as black people, as green people, as white people, we're seeing things that are affecting people, humans. So it's up yes. to us to say, hey, I'm not afraid to speak out against right and wrong because i'm kind of seeing past this white black thing that that you're painting for us you know and and oftentimes you know us being in this gulf coast area the disasters that we're used to seeing are hurricanes floods but now we're seeing this thing where 
we don't even know what we're in even anymore. So I'm just like, I don't even care anymore if I feel like what I could create or what I could say or what I could build will make someone else not fall into this machine of unreality so that Mm -hmm. the generations that come behind me won't turn into these just zombies that don't feel, that don't think, that don't feel as though they could just have their own opinion. You know, I'm like, hey, I'm I'm just going to do it. Who cares? Yeah. It's like, it's over now. So <laughs> that's kind of where I'm at with, you know, with the whole blackness thing and, you know, with everything, with the, the mandates and all of this. I feel like everything's crumbling, but I just feel like everyone needs to just have their own personal rights and opinions to just do what you feel is best for you, regardless of what they try to make you feel is the societal answer. Because when you really look at it, is it really you or is it something outside of you trying to mimic your internal mind? So I think this whole thing is kind of made it to where we have to kind of believe in ourselves as individuals. And then that's going to happen in your household, in your family. And from there, it's just going to spread into your community. But we got to just make our own platforms and do things for ourselves because the plug can get pulled any minute. So instead of us kind of always waiting around for uh, help or answer from someone else, we got to just start building it ourselves. That's the only way it's going to work. So that's what I got out of it as a black person. Yeah. And I think this boldness you talk about, Sean, is one that I've heard kind of resonating through our community, right? Which is like almost this feeling that the door is open, but we don't know how long it will be, right? That the conversation is centered around us right now, but that might not always be. So let's do the bold thing. Let's take the big step. Let's make the big statement right now while we can, because we might not get another chance to to make that statement again. You know, Shabelle, I kind of want to want to ask you because I know that from my own experience with opera, that there really is this big shift specifically within that genre of of people. Um, almost coming into understanding the things that we've been saying for a very long time that need to be changed. And some companies really tackling this idea of making room for voices of all kinds, not just Black voices. But I I point to Black voices specifically in looking at the Met, right? And Terrence Blanchard's new piece, Fire Shut Up in My Bones. And this idea of this 141-year history that's never seen a Black composer makes room for a Black composer. You know, for you, what what do you feel like? And this is going to be a question for both of you, but I'm starting kind of with you, Shabro. Mm-hmm. Just what is the responsibility then of the Black artist in a moment like right now? You know, I know Sean has mentioned kind of making, being big and doing the big bold mm-hmm. statement. But for you, especially in a genre that's shifting before your eyes, what kind of is our responsibility in your eyes? I agree with Sean and like the boldness that we need to take on. But I think that boldness is is that we should always, always be our authentic selves, when, no matter what space we go into. And that that is something that I strived to do before this pandemic hit, but I think I only did it partially. You know, I was like, okay, I'm gonna show up as like, you know, the authentic artist. I'm gonna show up as, you know, I'm gonna sing well, I'm gonna sing as well as I possibly can. I'm gonna learn the music as well as I possibly can. But like, as far as, being an activist and being socially conscious, I sort of took a step back because I didn't want to be taken as like the angry black woman or the one who always pulls the race card or the one who always brings race into something it was like, well, the time for that actually is now. The time for that, is, for like, for, for a black artist, I think in whatever space that we go into, specifically in opera, the time is now for us to make people uncomfortable when the the moment calls for it. We can no longer shy away in our art and in in our personal like interactions with anybody in the in whatever you know whatever companies we're working with to not shy away from being as extremely transparent as we possibly can um and that's with our art with social justice with administrative things with everything um and to also tell the stories that we like to not be afraid to tell the stories that we want to tell um 
for, and that this is specifically for any black creative um, in this industry, you know, don't, don't try to fit us, like don't try to fit into a box <laughs> because this industry will try and put you in a box. I have been trying to be put in a box, my whole industry. And like, I'm tired of it. <laughs> I'm tired of being placed into a box because I can do a lot of things. And like, I think for the longest time, I was afraid of my own voice and afraid of the my own creative ideas and the things that I wanted to execute separate from performing. Um, and like now that I've been given a chance, you know, I've had companies like who are doing this work to like try and change the the culture, essentially, like the very white supremacist culture that operate that the opera industry still sort of holds sort on of. to. I am, you know, I've had opportunities where opera companies are giving me opportunities to actually voice my ideas and actually have some form of leadership. And that's something I've, I've never wanted. I, I don't want to be a leader. Who wants to be a leader? That's, that's hmm, can't curse. That stuff is hard. Okay. That <laughs> stuff is hard. <laughs> I will not curse. I promise not to curse. Uh, uh, so yeah, I think, yeah, black artists and any artist of color at this point should just be open to being extremely transparent in everything that they do. Yeah. I, I think I agree with you and I'll push that I don't think it's just opera, right? No. I, think, I think the literary world on my end has definitely had that kind of reckoning. I think mm. the artistic world, and Sean, you can co completely correct me, but has kind of had to deal with the reckoning of like where black art lives and, and the value behind black art. You know, have you seen that? Do you, do you oh, think you've yeah. seen that, Sean? Oh yeah, all the time. Like I'm a, I am a, uh, I'm pretty vocal about value. So I, I tell a lot of younger artists that most of my conversations with people are more on like an educational standpoint mm -hmm. because I end up talking to my, you know, people in my community, people that are looking at my art about value. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I'm saying, hey, you know, it's not in a, it's not in a, a snooty way. It's more in a, in a manner in which I'm trying to get you to understand that if we don't grasp the concept of value and value ourselves on a personal level, you're, you're going to lose artists that want to do art that shows likenesses of their people, their community, if, if we can't get people from our community to invest in us mm -hmm. because we have to we have to feed our families we have to have revenue for supplies and it's it's called currency so when you think of currency you think of current it's it's all based on uh, electrical principles we need to be charged up when you come out and support if you can't afford the artwork, if you know someone that can, tell them about that that incredible artist or that 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 gallery owner in your community that's trying to put artwork that's diverse that shows more than just the stereotypical types of uh, scenarios in art. Just trying to kind of be bold and um, just show you all the sides of, of our culture. Spread the word because I feel like me coming to a gallery or a museum to actually talk to you about what inspired me to create these works or where I was at emotionally that caused me to create this, I'm helping you to walk away feeling better than you came. I'm spending that time to instill and inject hope into somebody because mm -hmm. I I don't know what they came from. They right. may have come from an abusive household. They may have been five minutes ago thinking about committing suicide, but I feel like I was given this talent to share so that I can make an impact on people but we need you just as 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 much to support us. 
And it, it, it starts with conversations, real conversations. So sometimes I have to be, you know, the, the jerk and say, hey, well, why, you know, why do you feel like this particular piece of art shouldn't cost more than X amount of dollars? And then it makes people kind of self-reflect. So mm -hmm. that's a lot of what I do is just through conversations. And I'm hoping that those conversations and the courage to have those conversations and ask questions and challenge you know, things that people may say a lot of times to black creatives that are very insulting may make them feel differently. So, so wait, I'm gonna push you a little bit. All right. And, and it's not so much to tell all the tea of the things that people <laughs> say to you, right? Because I won't make you I won't make you relive your own trauma. Mm -hmm. But what tends to be the most problematic things that you find people react to in your work? that you feel like is, is specifically because of a lens of race and not because of a lens of the value of your work. Mm -hmm. And Shabra, I'm gonna ask you the same question. So just percolate. Yep. <laughs> that, that's you know? a good question. Um, I, I'll have to move from the word value and examine the, the, uh, the connection to standard. Ooh, so, I like that, talk about that. It's pretty much like if if you go into a shop or if you walk to a booth that a a person of color is is uh, manning, oftentimes you you they'll 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 want to ask for the hookup or a discount, but then with other other ethnic groups, they they. Pay what it says. <laughs> so that, that's that's a lack of value, and that's uh, the absence of standards. You yeah. know, so from a creative standpoint, you have to realize that the same amount of man hours and talent and schooling and uh, supplies and all of those expenses that that I put in my work, it's pretty much the same thing that uh, another artist puts in his work. And so when you get that from someone that looks like you, it's it's pretty sad. So that's the main reason why I will take the L on you purchasing or not purchasing this art to have a conversation with you to explain, hey, what what you just done is bigger than you think. Because yeah. I have, you know, children at home and they see me working not only in my art career, but in my you know, corporate career. They see all the time that I put into what I do and they know that I'm doing it for myself for my community and for them. So when you bring what you bring out to the public and it's shining a glorious light on people that look like you, you want that reciprocated yeah. in any way possible. If you can't if you can't afford to buy it, you can afford to say some kind inspiring words. Because a lot of the a lot of the words and, and, and the time that people have taken out to say, oh, man, that is beautiful, man. I really I appreciate you doing that and taking the time to do that. I, had, I go back and, and I use that as energy yeah. on my journey. So we got to yeah. learn how to be more supportive to, to each other because yeah. it's, it works. And, and I don't mind telling someone that, you know, another man, I'm, I'm not that kind of guy that won't say, hey, man, you are incredible. Because right. I, I know that means a lot to this man for another man to say that to him because we, we're caught up in this incorrect standard of, of not being supportive of each other, of not, you know, of not telling someone this probably way better than you that hey i really admire your work and me watching what you do has inspired me to go and work on my craft we got to start doing that
we yeah, gotta yeah. start doing that. You know, I mean, so I that, really, that's my thing. You know, yeah, I think that really does tie to value, though, like you were talking about, Sean, because I think it's not just a monetary value, right? Like that, the artwork that mm-hmm. we do really does have a value that moves beyond money. That it's that it's cultural, that it's communal, <laughs> that is, you know, it, it moves our society along. Um, yeah. and that is has nothing to do with race in some ways, right? Um, that just has to do with human connection. Yeah. Right. So, Sherelle, for you, those misconceptions, the, the, the kind of greatest misconceptions of the Black opera singer. <laughs> well, well, the label it as. Yeah, uh, I mean, so the misconception is like, you know, that there are Black opera singers. Like I still, so like I, I literally went to go see Fire Shut Up in, in My Bones. I just went to go support my friends and just be there, be in the room, see a live show after so long. And like, but also like just be in a Black space and just like feel the energy. And, you know, as I'm sitting there, you know, there are obviously people around me and I decided to like, you know, I decided to get a fancy seat and like get one of those in the, like the parterre is like the one of the little side things. And so I was surrounded by white people and like, like the only black person like sitting there. And so like, they were obviously interested and I had brought like some music with me because like, you know, I'm learning this role. So like, I was like, okay, well, I'll practice while I'm waiting for the show to go. And so like, of course that makes people curious. So then but I, what I thought was interesting, they didn't ask me, like, what does it feel like to be a Black opera singer? And I, I actually, there was a moment where I got really emotional because they, there were people around me who were just seemed really interested in the work that I was doing. And, you know, not me just being a Black person doing the work, but just the work. Mm-hmm. And, you know, going off of what Sean says about, like, being, like, feeling like you're supported. I think for a while I haven't felt like I've been supported in my you know, obviously like my family supports me, my friends support me, but because I am so introverted and like don't know a lot of people in the industry, I often don't feel like I get the support from those people. Mm-hmm. And it, but and like, but then the support that I get from people, like the strangers that I don't know is like, oh, you're so great for a black person. Like, mm-hmm. you're so great singing, like, thank you for like what you're doing for the craft. But like, I, I'm, I'm just a singer. I'm not a black opera singer. There are so many of us, and yeah, I don't know. I feel like I'm rambling. Um, no, I, I don't think you are though. I think <laughs> it's kind of idea not at all. <laughs> that there needs to be representation. That you know, it's it's kind of like finding Waldo, right? Like people are like, oh, I found a black one, right? <laughs> it's, it's like no, there's plenty of us, right? There's like, several so, of I'm us. My stripes, right? Like this is not fancy, <laughs> right? Um, I do think that that happens a lot, and I, I think yeah. that happens in a lot of arenas artistically, right? Where we're, it's like, oh my goodness, you can play classical music or oh my goodness, you can write a novel. You know, I I think there are still so many firsts that need to be made that it it still is like almost the anomaly, right? Right. Um, And 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 that can be difficult. Yeah. And then like a lot of the people that were like taking, like thought I was in the show because Mm -hmm. it's a black show. And I was like, actually, I I have nothing to do with this show. I'm just here to see my friends, Uh, but I'm doing other things. And like, you know, that was like, oh, okay, well, what then what are you doing? And I was like, well, well, this, this, and that. I'm like, yeah, we we do, we're we're not just in the chorus. We're, you know, we're not just Mm -hmm. here singing black music and like in the (laughs) shows with black people. Like we, there's, there are many of us who just love the art form. Yep, yeah. So I, I love that you all have touched kind of on what you want from the audience as far as support goes, right? Is this understanding our value, understanding who we are, understanding we're not the anomaly or the exception, right? That we can fill all the spaces and take up all the room. So I'm going to shift us kind of for our last question, which is um, knowing that responsibility from the really audience, from the audience the what do you think that Black artists um, should be doing as kind of the world opens back up again, right? Where we're hopefully on the, on the cusp of being outside of our houses, kind of, sort of. Mm-hmm. In Texas, I mean, we never left, but <laughs> that's a whole other thing, right? Um, but for us thinking about, you know, that the world is starting to move towards, back to, kind of towards what our normal was, if that's what you'd like to call it, what then should we be considering in moving the needle on the way that we're perceived and the way that we're valued that you all both so eloquently talked about? Sean, you want to start us off? Uh, I kind of want to. I kind of want to suppress. Okay. So the question is, as a creative, what do I suggest 
we could do to make things better in the in the new in this new this new normal we're in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say, and you and and is this is this answer for black people or a community as a whole? Um, I want to say for for black artists specifically, just because we've talked about that the world is kind of in this moment where ears are a little bit more open to us, right? Eyes are a little bit more open to us. What do we do okay. to continue to push that so that remains a thing that's not just a moment, right? I got one. Um, I really feel like we should take this time that we're in because we're still not in full normalcy. Yeah. I really think we should take this time to work on professionalism. Mm -hmm. the, the things that happen before it happens mm -hmm. to make the it more it mm. by that oftentimes there's there's small things that tend to be overlooked tend to not be prioritized but those small things and uh, attention to those small things planning knowing the importance of those small things is what makes greatness. So I really feel like we should try to do more things like developmental workshops. Mm. We need to do more things like bringing working professionals in to talk to aspiring creatives. Mm in that same field so that they won't look at things like oh the pamphlet says if i do this then i'll get that they really need to talk to real people that's really in this world of creativity to to know what happens before the it happens because again i'll tie it back to social media and this new digital insta world that we're in there's so much that goes on before the it happens and i think a lot of the the younger creatives and often i would even say some of the uh, the the corporations that need us to make their vehicle shinier they need to really be educated on the, the the minute elements that make the big picture look beautiful. So I really think we need to start creating workshops, uh, small talk sessions where we can unwrap things and I could show you the dirty parts mm -hmm. and I could show you how to clean the dirty parts and how to work around the roadblocks and how to deal with different personalities and things of that nature. I think that needs to be done on both sides because I've seen the creatives come in where they could move a little better and, and be a little more professional. And I've also seen corporations bring me in where I've spent all this time trying to be professional and then I'm dealing with someone in this larger vehicle that makes, that attempts to make me feel as if what I do isn't really that valuable. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people that if it wasn't for someone being able to draw a glyph, we wouldn't even have words or letters. So right. don't let anyone tell you as a creative that you're not important because believe it or not, we wouldn't even be able to see this podcast interview that we're doing if it wasn't for a designer 
designing this program and creating this interface that you're watching it on. So I really think we need to give and create platforms for the generations to come, for those that are interested, that don't even realize that, oh, I can't paint, I can't sing, but you still are creative. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because a creative can be someone that brings people together, that organizes the mm -hmm. event, that knows that I need to have someone at the front door dressed neatly to open mm -hmm. the door for people. Yeah. It's so much that's needed, but I think that we need to create platforms and workshops to kind of show people how to build the inside of the machine that we call create uh, creativity. I think that would be wonderful. I love because, that. Cause, cause yeah, it really I really think like, we need that. It really yeah. sounds like mentorship, right? It really yes. sounds like yes. on that space. And I think that that thinking of how do we not only walk through the doors ourselves, but I often tell people, I will walk through the door and I'm gonna take it off the hinges, right? <laughs> I'm thinking about really, how do we take it off the hinges for the people behind us, which I think is so smart. Yes. Shabrell, what about you? The thing that comes to mind for me is like, you know, to, to really continue on with this track of change and to really implement it is for black artists to be fearless. <laughs> to be fearless, to no longer live in fear of how we're going to be perceived, how our work is going to be valued, supported, and perceived, on how our work might present our culture to the world. We need to be fearless and tell the stories that we want to tell, talk about the things that we want to talk about, fix the things, find solutions for the things that we want to find solutions for without fear of backlash, um, without fear of anything, because the time of change is now and there cannot be change without discomfort. Mm. And yeah, the time for discomfort is now. And I think it's, I don't know, I, th I feel like I've thrived in areas of where things are not certain. And for us to get uh, used to ambiguity mm. uh, <laughs> and work with it, like let's 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 dive into the ambiguity of things and like let's let's be scared a little bit before before we try something new and work together and let's let's also not be afraid of collaboration and like collaborating with other black creatives with other any creative because at the end of the day like at the end of this hurdle that we have mm -hmm. like with this whole racial reckoning that's happening on at the end of it we are all human we are all human and we all need to learn how to work with each other and learn how to embrace and celebrate all of our cultures. So like, let's just move away from our differences and start <laughs> and just start. <laughs> yeah. I think that, that is a perfect way to end us out, Sherelle. I think it's for us to start just thinking about just starting, right? Like just abandon what it has to be, what it could be, abandon all the fears, abandon all those things and just start, whether it's a conversation, whether it's creating artwork, whether it's creating mentorship, just start. Yeah. Just start. Well, thank you both so much for just taking time to chat with me. Um, you yeah. provided so much insight and so much wisdom, I think, for people as we continue to live in our current world's intermission, right? But as the play gets ready to start again and as we get ready to go back into living kind of closer to normalcy and I think these are things that we all need to know and all need to just keep at the forefront of our minds. So I'm just eternally grateful to both of you. Um, we'll put both of your information in the notes below. So please follow Shabrell, please follow Sean, please follow myself, because I think we have so much more to show the world and we would love to have you be a part. I'm gonna bring back in Claire um, and I just thank you all for, for tuning in with us today. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you all so much for joining us for this really thoughtful, insightful, and and really important conversation. It honestly was an honor to listen in to the three of you. Um, and, I, and I'm really grateful for you for uh, sharing your time with us today and um, for for sharing your thoughts and, uh, and and allowing our audience to kind of get a get a deep dive into the themes of Deborah's, Deborah's piece, The World's Intermission, and um, learn more about sort of what this experience, the, these past 18 months have been like for artists of color and, and how we can move forward in a way that really, um, you know, makes things better for everyone. Um, 
I hope that everyone watching will join us in person at Jones Hall on November 12th and 13th at 7.30 p.m. to witness the premiere of Deborah Deet Mouton's new work, The World's Intermission. Tickets are available at spahouston.org, linked below. Um, and just like Deborah said, I encourage you to connect with me with the work of Shabral and Sean and Deborah, um, and, and we'll have all that information below as well. So thank you again for, for joining us, and we hope to see you soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>